time. Thank you for coming. I'm reading today a short story of Truman Capote's called A Christmas Memory. And it's um, kind of, everything I can read says that it's at least partially autobiographical. And I think it probably is, knowing his history and everything. A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. Imagine a morning in late November, a coming of winter morning more than 25 years ago. Consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town. A great black stove is its main feature, but there's also a big round table and a fireplace with two rocking chairs placed in front of it. Just today, the fireplace commences its seasonal roar. A woman with shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen window. She's wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She is small and sprightly, like a bantam hen. But due to a long youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that, and tinted by sun and wind. But it is delicate too, finely boned, and her eyes are sherry-colored and timid. Oh my, she exclaims, her breath smoking the window pane. It's fruitcake weather. The person to whom she is speaking is myself. I am seven. She is 60-something. We're cousins, very distant ones. But we have lived together, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives, and though they have power over us and frequently make us cry, we are not on the whole too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy, in memory of a boy who was formerly her best friend. The other Buddy died in the 1880s when she was still a child. She is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed this morning, she said, turning away from the window with a purposeful excitement in her eyes. The courthouse bell sounded so cold and clear, and there were no birds singing. They've all gone to warmer country. Yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuits and fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. We've 30 cakes to make. It's always the same. A morning arrives in November, and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year that exhilarates her imagination and fuels the blaze of her heart, her heart announces, It's fruitcake weather. Fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. The hat is found. It's a straw cartwheel corsaged with velvet roses out of doors has faded. It once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together we guide our buggy, a dilapidated baby carriage, out to the garden and into a grove of pecan trees. The buggy is mine. That is, it was bought for me when I was born. It is made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But it's a fateful object. Springtimes, we take it to the woods and fill it with flowers, herbs, wild fern for our porch pots. In summer, we pile it with picnic paraphernalia and sugarcane fishing poles and roll down to the edge of the creek. It has its winter uses, too, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yard to the kitchen and as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier who has survived dysteria, distemper, and two rattlesnake bites. Queenie is trotting beside it now. Three hours later, we're back in the kitchen, hulling a heaping buggy load of windfall pecans. 
our backs hurt from gathering them, how hard they are to find. The main crop, having been shaken off the trees and sold by the orchard's owners, who are not us. Hard to find among the concealing leaves and frosted, deceiving grass. Crackle, a cheery crunch, scraps of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse and the golden mound of sweet, oily ivory meat mounds in the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste, and now and again my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. We mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop, and there's scarcely enough as there is for 30 cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dusk turns the window into a mirror. Our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final hull into the fire and with joined sighs, watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty, the bowl is brimful. We eat our supper, cold biscuits, bacon, blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow, the kind of work I like best begins. Buying. Cherries and citron, Ginger and vanilla and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and raisins and walnuts and whiskey and oh, so much flour and butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings. Why, we'll need a pony to pull the buggy home. But before these purchases can be made, there is the question of money. Neither of us has any except for skin flint sums persons in the house occasionally provide. A dime is considered very big money. Or what we earn ourselves from various activities, holding rummage sales, selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries and jars of homemade jam and apple jelly and peach preserves, rounding up flowers for funerals and weddings, once we won 79th prize, five whole dollars, in a national football contest. Not that we know a fool thing about football. It's just that we enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested A.M., and after some hesitation, for my friend thought perhaps it might be sacrilegious, we submitted the slogan, A.M. Amen. To tell the truth, our only really profitable enterprise was the fun and freak museum we conducted in the backyard woodshed two summers ago. The fun was a stereopticon with slide views of Washington and New York lent to us by a relative who had been to these places. She was furious when she discovered why we borrowed it. The freak was a three-legged bitty chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody abouts wanted to see that bitty. We charged grown-ups a nickel and kids two cents, and we took in a good $20 before the museum shut down due to the decease of the main attraction. But one way and another, we do each year accumulate Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. These monies we keep hidden in an ancient bead purse under a loose board, under the floor, under a chamber pot, under my friend's bed. The purse is seldom removed from this safe location except to make a deposit or, as happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. For on Saturdays, I am allowed 10 cents to go to the picture show. 
My friend has never been to a picture show, nor does she ever intend to. I'd rather hear you tell the story, buddy. That way I can imagine it more. Besides, a person my age shouldn't squander their eyes. When the Lord comes, let me see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, she has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from home, received or sent a telegram, read anything except the funny papers and the Bible, worn cosmetics, cursed, wished somebody harm, told a lie on purpose, or let a hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things she has done, does do. Killed with a hoe, the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this county. Sixteen rattles. Dipped snuff secretly. Tamed hummingbirds, you just try it, until they balance on her finger. Tell ghost stories, we both believe in ghosts. So tingling, they chill you in July. Talk to herself. Take walks in the rain. Grow the prettiest japonicas in town. And know the recipe for every sort of old-time Indian cure, including a magical wart remover. Now, with supper finished, we retire to the room in a faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt covered iron bed painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills tightly rolled and green as maybuds. Somber 50 cent pieces, heavy enough to weigh it Wait a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters worn smooth as creek, as creek pebbles, but mostly a handful, a pile of bitter odored pennies. Last summer, others in the house contracted to pay us a penny for every 25 flies we killed. Oh, the carnage of August. The flies that flew to heaven. Yet it was not work in which we took much pride. And as we sat counting pennies, it was as though we were back tabulating dead flies. Neither of us has a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, start again. According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly $13. Oh, I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with 13. The cakes will fall or, somebody, or put somebody in the cemetery. Why, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13th in bed. So to be on the safe side, we subtract a penny and throw it out the window. Of the ingredients that go into our fruit cake, whiskey is the most expensive, as well as the hardest to obtain. State law forbids its sale, but everybody knows you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones and the next day, having complete our, completed our more, more prosaic shopping, we set out for Mr. Ha Ha's business address. A sinful, to quote public opinion, fish, fish fry and dance cafe down by the river. We've been there before and on the same errand, but in previous years, our dealings have been with Ha Ha's wife, an iodine dark Indian woman with brassy peroxide hair and a dead, tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard that he's an Indian too, a giant with razor scars across his cheeks. They call him Ha Ha because he's so gloomy, 
a man who never laughs. As, and as we approached the cafe, which is a large log cabin festooned inside and out with chains of garish, gay, naked light bulbs, and standing by the river's muddy edge under the shade of river trees where moss drifts through the branches like gray mist. Our steps slow down. Even Queenie stops prancing and sticks close by. People have been murdered in Ha Ha's Cafe, cut to pieces, hit on the head. There's a case coming up in court next month. Naturally, these goings on happen at night when the colored lights cast crazy patterns and Victrola wails. In the daytime, Ha Ha's is a shabby and looks and is deserted. I knock on the door. Queenie barks. My friend calls. Miss Ha Ha, madam? Anybody to home? Footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts turn over. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself, and he is a giant. He does have scars, and he doesn't smile. No, he glares at us through Satan-tilted eyes and demands to know, what do you want with Ha Ha? For a moment, we're too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice, a whispery voice at best. If you please, Mr. Ha Ha, we'd like to buy a quart of your finest whiskey. His eyes tilt more. Would you believe it? Ha Ha is smiling, laughing too. Which one of you is a drinking man? It's for making fruit cakes, Mr. Ha Ha, cooking. Well, this sobers him. He frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shadowed cafe and second la seconds later appears carrying a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled unla liquid. He demonstrates its sparkle in the sunlight and says, Two dollars! We pay him with nickels and dimes and pennies. Suddenly, jangling the coins in his hand like a fistful of dice, his face softens. Tell you what, he proposes, pouring the money back into our beaded purse. Just send me one of them fruit cakes instead. Well, my friend remarks on our way home, there's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisins in his fruit cake. The black stove, stoked with coal and firewood, glows like a lighted pumpkin. Egg beater swirl. Spoons spin round in the bowls of butter and sugar. Vanilla sweetens the air. Ginger spices it. Melting, nose-tingling odors saturate the kitchen, suffuse the house, drift out to the world on puffs of chimney smoke. In four days, our work is done. Thirty-one cakes, dampened with whiskey, bask on the windowsills and shelves. And who are they for? Well, friends. Not necessarily neighbor friends. Indeed, the largest share are intended for persons we've met maybe once, perhaps not at all. People who struck our fancy, like President Roosevelt, like the Reverend and Mrs. J.C. Lucy, Baptist min min missionaries to Borneo, who lectured here last winter, or the little knife grinder who comes through town twice a year, or Abner Packer, the driver of the six o'clock bus from Mobile, who exchanges waves with us every day as he passes in a dust cloud swoop. Or the young Wistons, a California couple, whose car one afternoon broke down outside the house and who spent a pleasant hour chatting with us on the porch. Young Mr. Wiston snapped our picture, the only one we've ever had taken. Is it because my friend is shy with everyone except strangers that these strangers and mere acquaintances seem to us our truest friends? 
I think yes. Also, the scrapbooks we keep of thank yous on White House stationery, time to time communications from California and Borneo, the knife grinders penny postcards make us feel connected to the world beyond the kitchen with its view of a sky that stops. Now a new December fig branch grates against the window. The kitchen is empty, the cakes are gone. Yesterday, we carted the last of them to the post office, where the cost of stamps turned our purse inside out. We're broke. That rather depresses me, but my friend insists on celebrating. With two inches of whiskey left in Ha Ha's bottle, Queenie has a spoonful in a bowl of coffee. She likes coffee, chicory flavored and strong. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. The taste of it brings screwed up expressions and sour shudders. But by and by, we begin to sing. The two of us singing different songs simultaneously. I don't know the words to mine. It's just, come on along, come on along to the Dark Town Strutter's Ball. But I can dance. That's what I mean to be, a tap dancer in the movies. My dancing shadow rollicks on the walls. Our voices rock the chinaware. We giggle as if unseen hands were tickling us. Queenie rolls on her back. Her paws plow the air. Something like a grin stretches her black lips. Inside myself, I feel warm and sparky as those crumbling logs, carefree as the wind in the chimney. My friend waltzes around the stove. The hem of her poor calico skirt pinched between her fingers as though it were a party dress. Show me the way to go home, she sings, her tennis shoes squeaking on the floor. Show me the way to go home. Enter two relatives, very angry, portent with eyes that scold and tongues that scald. Listen to what they have to say, the words tumbling together. A child of seven, whiskey on his breath? Are you out of your mind? Feeding a child of seven must be loony. Road to ruin. Remember Cousin Kate and Uncle Charlie, Uncle Charlie's brother-in-law. Shame, scandal, humiliation. Kneel, pray, beg the Lord. Queenie sneaks under, sneaks under the stove. My friend gazes at her shoes. Her chin quivers. She lifts her skirt and blows her nose and runs to her room. Long after the town has gone to sleep and the house is silent except for the chimings of clocks and the sputter of fading fires, she is weeping into a pillow, already as wet as a widow's handkerchief. Don't cry, I say, sitting at the bottom of her bed and shivering despite my flannel nightgown that smells of last winter's cough syrup. Don't cry, I beg, teasing her toes and tickling her feet. You're too old for that. It's because, she hiccups, I am too old. Old and funny. Not funny, fun. More fun than anybody. Listen, if you don't stop crying, you'll be so tired tomorrow we can't go cut a tree. She straightens up. Queenie jumps on the bed, she's not allowed, and licks her cheeks. I know where we'll find real pretty trees, buddy, and holly, too, with berries as big as your eyes. It's way off in the woods, further than we have ever been. Papa used to bring us Christmas trees from there, carry them on his shoulder. That's 50 years ago. 
Well, now, I can't wait for morning. Morning. Frozen rime lusters the grass. The sun, round as an, as an orange and orange as hot weather moons, balances on the horizon. Burnishes the, the silvered winter woods. A wild turkey calls. A renegade hog grunts in the undergrowth. Soon, by the edge of knee-deep, rapid-running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Queenie ra wades the stream first, paddles across, barking complaints at the swiftness of the current and the pneumonia-making coldness of it. We follow, holding our shoes and equipment, a hatchet and a burlap sack above our heads. A mile more, a chastising, chastising thorns burrows that catch at our clothes, a rusty of rusty pine needles brilliant with gaudy fungus and molted feathers. Here there is a flash and a flutter of ecstasy, of shrilling reminding us that not all the birds have flown south. Always the path unwinds through lemony sun pools and pitch vine tunnels. Another creek to cross. A disturbed armada of speckled trout froth the water around us, and frogs the size of plates practice belly flops. Beaver workmen are building a dam. On the further shore, Queenie shakes herself and trembles. My friend shivers too, not with cold, but with enthusiasm. One of her hat's ragged roses sheds a petal as she lifts her head and inhales the pine heavy air. We're almost there. Can you smell it, buddy? She says as though we were approaching an ocean. And indeed, it is a kind of ocean. Scented acres of holiday trees, prickly leafed holly, red berries shiny as Chinese bells, black crows swooping upon them, screaming. Having stuffed our burlap stack, sack with enough greenery and crimson to garland a dozen windows, we set about choosing a tree. It should be, muses my friend, twice as tall as a boy, so a boy can't steal the star. The one we pick is twice as tall as me. A brave, handsome brute that survives 30 hatchet strokes before it kills with a creaking, cracking, rendering cry. Lugging it like a kill, we commence the long trek out. Every few yards, we abandon the struggle, sit down and pant. But we have the strength of triumphant huntsmen. That and the tree's virile, icy perfume revives us, goads us on. Many compliments accompany our sunset return along the red clay road to town, but my friend is sly and non-committal. When passers-by praise the treasure perched in our buggy, what a fine tree, and where did it come from? Oh, yonder way, she murmurs vaguely. Once a car stops, and the rich mill owner's lazy wife leans out and whines, Give you two bits cash for that old tree. Ordinarily, my friend is afraid of saying no, but on this occasion, she promptly shakes her head. We wouldn't take a dollar. The mill owner's wife persists. A dollar my foot? Fifty cents, that's my last offer. Goodness, woman, you can get another one. In answer, my friend gently reflects. I doubt it. There's never two of anything. Home, Queenie slumps by the fire and sleeps till tomorrow, snoring as loud as a human. A trunk in the attic contains a shoebox of ermine tails off an opera cape of a curious lady who once rented a room in the house. Coils of frazzled tinsel gone gold with age. One silver star a brief rope of dilapidated, undoubtedly dangerous candy-like light bulbs, 
excellent decorations as far as they go, which isn't far enough. My friend wants our tree to blaze like a Baptist window, drooped with weighty snows of ornaments. But we can't afford the man, the made in Japan splendors at the five and dime. So we do what we've always done. For days, sit at the kitchen table with scissors and crayons and stacks of colored paper. I make sketch, sketches and my friend cuts them out. Lots of cats, fish too because they're easy to draw, some apples, some watermelons, a few winged angels devised from saved up sheets of Hershey bar tinfoil. We use safety pins to attach these creations to the tree. As a final touch, we sprinkle the branches with shredded cotton picked in August for this purpose. My friend, surveying the effects, claps her hands together. How, now honest buddy, doesn't it look good enough to eat? Queenie tries to eat an angel. After we, weaving and ribbering holly wreaths for all the front windows, our next project is fashioning the family gifts Tie-dyed scarves for the ladies. For the men, a homebrew lemon, licorice, and aspirin syrup to be taken at the first signs of a cold and after hunting. But when it comes time for making each other's gifts, my friend and I separate to work secretly. I would like to buy her a pearl-handled knife, a radio, a whole pound of chocolate-covered cherries, we tasted some once, and she always swears, I could live on them, buddy. Lord, yes, I could. And that's not taking his name in vain. Instead, I'm building her a kite. She would like to give me a bicycle. She said so on several million occasions. If only I could, buddy. It's bad enough in life to do without something you want. But confound it, what gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something you want them to have. Only one of these days I will, buddy. I'll locate you a bike. Don't ask how. Might steal it. Instead, I'm fairly certain that she's making me a kite, the same as last year and the year before. The year before that, we exchanged slingshots all of which is fine with me, for we are champion kite flyers who study the wind like sailors. My friend, more accomplished than I, can get a kite aloft when there isn't enough breeze to carry clouds. Christmas Eve afternoon, we scrape together a nickel and go to the butcher's to buy Queenie's traditional gift, a good, knowable beef bone. The bone, wrapped in funny paper, is placed high on the tree near the silver star. Queenie knows it's there. She squats at the foot of the tree, staring up in a trance of greed. When bedtime arrives, she refuses to budge. Her excitement is equaled only by my own. I kick the covers and turn my pillow as though it were a scorching hot summer night. Somewhere, a rooster crows, falsely, for the sun is still on the other side of the world. Buddy, are you awake? It's my friend, calling from her room, which is next to mine, and an instant later, she is sitting on my bed, holding a candle. Well, I can't sleep worth a hoot, she declares. My mind's jumping like a jackrabbit. Buddy, do you think Miss Roosevelt will serve our cake at dinner? We huddle in the bed and she squeezes my hand. I love you. Seems like your hand used to be much smaller. I guess I hate to see you grow up. When you grow up, will we still be friends? I say, always. But I feel so bad, Buddy. I wanted so bad to give you a bike. I tried to sell my cameo Papa gave me. Buddy, she hesitates, as though embarrassed. I made you another kite. Then I confess that I made her one too. And we laugh, 
The candle burns too short to hold. Out it goes, exposing the starlight. The stars spinning at the window like visible caroling that slowly, slowly disappears into silence. Possibly we doze. But the beginnings of dawn splash us like cold water. We're up, wide-eyed and wandering, while we wait for the others to waken. Quite deliberately, my friend drops the kettle on the kitchen floor. I tap dance in front of the closed doors. One by one, the household emerges, looking as though they'd like to kill us both. But it's Christmas, so they can't. First, a gorgeous breakfast, just everything you can imagine. From flapjacks and fried squirrel to hominy grits and honey in the comb, which puts everybody in a really good humor, except my friend and I. Frankly, we're so impatient to get at the presents, we can't eat a mouthful. Well, I'm disappointed. Who wouldn't be? with socks, a Sunday school shirt, some handkerchiefs, a hand-me-down sweater, and a year's subscription to a religious magazine for children, The Little Shepherd. It makes me boil. It really does. My friend has a better haul, a sack of plums. That's her best present. She is proudest, however, of a white wool shawl knitted by her, her married sister, but she says her favorite gift is the kite I built for her. And it is very beautiful, though not as beautiful as the one she made for me, which is blue and scattered with gold and green good conduct stars. Moreover, my name is painted on it, Buddy. Buddy, the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing, and nothing will do till we run to the pasture beyond the house where Queenie has scooted to bury her bone, and where, a winter hence, Queenie will be buried too. There, plunging through the healthy, waist-high grass, we unreal our kites, feel them twitching at the string like sky fish as they swim into the wind. Satisfied, sun-warmed, We sprawl in the grass and peel plums and watch our kites cavort. Soon I forget the socks and hand-me-down sweater. I'm as happy as if we'd already won the $50,000 grand prize for that coffee naming contest. My, how foolish I am, my friend cries, suddenly alert, like a woman remembering too late she has biscuits in the oven. You know what I've always thought, she asked in a tone of discovery, and not smiling at me, but a point beyond. I've always thought a body would have to be sick and dying before they saw the Lord. And I imagine that when he came, it would be like looking at the Baptist window, pretty as colored glass with the sun pouring through, such a shine you don't know it's even getting dark. And it's been a comfort to think of that shine taking away all the spooky feelings. But I'll wager that never happens. I'll wager at the very end, a body realizes the Lord has already shown himself. That things as they are, are just what they have always seemed. That was seeing him. As for me... I could leave the world with today in my eyes. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide that I belong in a military school, and so follows a miserable succession of bugle-blowing prisons, grim, revelry-ridden summer camps. I have a new home, too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen alone with Queenie, then alone. 
Buddy, dear, she writes in her wild, hard read script, yesterday, Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie bad. Be thankful she didn't feel much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buggy down to Simpson's pasture where she can be with all of her bones. For a few Novembers, she continues to bake her fruitcakes single-handed. Not as many, but some. And of course, she always sends me the best of the batch. Also, in every letter, she encloses a dime wadded in toilet paper. See a picture show and write me a story. But gradually, in her letters, she tends to confuse me with her other friend, the buddy who died in, 1880, in the 1880s. More and more 13s are not the only days she stays in bed. A morning arrives in November, a leafless, birdless coming of winter morning, when she cannot rouse herself to exclaim, Oh my, it's fruitcake weather. And when that happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein had already received, severing from me an irreplaceable part of myself, letting it loose like a kite on a broken string. That is why, walking across the school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky as if I expect to see rather like hearts, a lost pair of kites hurrying towards heaven. <laughs>